Welcome back to the Lantern Roost Cycling Podcast. Here with Benji for the first installment of our team previews, a hot success last year, and I'm very excited they're back this year. We're starting with Trek Segafredo. They're one of the first teams. We thank you, Trek, for completing their roster, 31 riders for 2022, so we can get cracking on them. Even though we are recording this on Tuesday, 23rd of November, Benji's birthday, felicitations to him. Make sure you congratulate him on Twitter. Um, even though it's the 23rd of November, a lot of teams still haven't announced their complete roster. But anyway, onwards with Trek. What we'll do is how this is structured, just the same way as last year, season review in 2021, transfers in and out, squads that we project for each discipline next year, Grand Tours, Classics, Hilly One Days, and then we'll do an over-under on World Tour wins that are set completely arbitrarily, and then obviously the, the famous or infamous, depending on how you see it, hot takes section to round it off. But Benny, could you just explain Trek Segafredo, American registered team, Trek an American company, I believe, but yes, I guess they got the Italian component as well with Segafredo, which we see in a lot of their signings. Yes, certainly. And I think that was a major reason for them to get Nibali involved a few years ago. Now they still have Italian riders in their squad. Ciccone is still here, one of the uh, more known Italian riders currently in the peloton and they seem to be investing a lot into Italian youngsters and we will see that in a second in the transfers portion and I think that's also dependent on their relation to certain U23 teams they've had quite a few transfers coming from one team Copac Ballon in their history and that's an Italian uh I don't know feeder team U23 team and it's not really connected to them I think I don't think it's like 100% 100% that that team is the U23 team of Trek, but it's a team that usually has Trek as an interest in their riders. And this year we've got a rider coming from there as well. But yeah, I think it's Segafredo's sponsor that's doing that. So we'll get straight into their season review in 2021. But before we do that, mention our show partner, Lacole, who produced performance cycling apparel based in the UK, expanding quickly internationally, now sponsoring Bora Hansgrohe back in the World Tour next year, as well as Ambassadors, Cancellara, Wiggins, and Johan Museo, who I think Benji says he sees occasionally on rides in the Lacole kit. But if you want to check them out, they're at www.lacole.cc. They've been supporting the show since its inception last year. That's www.lacole.cc. But Benji, Trek Segafredo, in 2021, two World Tour wins. Nine, uh, I'm not counting national champs. National champs, I'm flicking. Uh, yeah. So they won 15 pro races, two World Tour wins, but one was a monument, Milano San Remo Sturvin, and one was a Tour de France stage to break with Balca Molenbubu. 15 wins, two at World Tour level. It's, for me, not a good return. Yeah, it's not enough. I think last season we were looking for them to do better than 2020, which obviously is the case because there's many more races that they rode, but did they do better when it comes to World Tour wins? And that's where I'm like, it depends on how you see the monument of Steven because I think that for a team, a monument victory can do a lot, but only one stage went across three Grand Tours and across all the one-week races that we have in World Tour is just not enough for a team like Trek Segafredo. And especially because the team is so focused on attacking riders and I think that an aspect to this is that they went to the Giro with Ciccone as leader and Nibali with his wrist injured. So you're basically True. saying to yourself, we're restricting ourselves here. Molema focused on the one-day races, which didn't go as successfully as people were expecting, as we were expecting even last year. And therefore, he wasn't that great in breakaway stage in the Giro itself. In the Tour, he did get that stage win. And they did get, I think, three podiums in other stages during that Tour de France. So were they having a lot of almost? Sure, but in the Vuelta, they should also just have a a rider or two that are at least getting close or having a stage win, to be honest. Peterson, all over the year, he won Kuna, for example, and won a a few stages here and there, but not World Tour level. And Peterson really disappointed for me. But he had COVID, of course. Yeah, COVID seems to have been a massive problem for for them in the spring and that's why 
I guess that's a big reason one would think for the disappointing results there. Like Pedersen, for example, E3, DNF, Hen Wevelhem, DNS, Ronde van Vlaanderen, DNF. Something wasn't right there. Out of those three races, only one top 10, which was Sturven, who was strong, Tour of Flanders fourth. And yeah, Omloop and Kerner is the emblematic of that, Benji, where Omloop was a bit of a disaster, not making that 30-man group. Yeah. And then they win the next day at Kerner, which I know it's not a world tour race, but I sort of counts as one uh, to me. But yeah, two world tour wins. Sturvan at MSR, right place, right time, have to be strong to do it. Uh, so all credit to him for that. But is it replic- replicable? Probably not uh, next year, like one wouldn't expect. And Mollema, Benji, to your point, I'm giving Mollema a – well, I think he had a fine season. He was just heavily overraced. In my view, mm-hmm. 81 race days, which is a lot. Giro, he clearly wasn't in good form, getting dropped in breaks where he was better than a lot of those riders. And you saw his true level at the Tour when he won, riding away from a stronger group, won Trofeo La Guelia. And then, yeah, 81 race days is a lot. So I think a lot fell on Molima Benji with Ciccone not – focusing on the the one days where you think actually Ciccone would be the hilly one day racer uh, to take some of the load off Molina, but he didn't do the Italian classics Ciccone probably because of the crash at the Welter I assume um, was it a bad crash because he DNF both Welter and Giro with crashes I vaguely remember the crash so I actually don't remember if it was a uh, very uh consequential for the rest of the season I would expect so as well because you would have him at the Lombardia race uh, if he's in good enough form to be there you know because he always usually does it and uh, they were focusing on Nibali for that uh, in 2021 as a consequence so I would see that as a reason but yeah do you think that Chicone should have gone for stage wins in that Giro no or is that too hindsight no I think it's fine to go for stages. I'm not sure if he was going for stages in the Vuelta. That's the one where he seemed to be clearly undercooked but still trying to hold on GC a little bit. But in the Giro, I don't know when he, where he was. He was fifth or sixth or something. I think that's fine to go for stages. Was Nibali going for stages? That's the question. I, I'm not sure. What do you mean? Right? Uh, sorry, yeah. Giacconi to go for GC was fine. Nibali, I'm not sure what he was doing. He came like 18th, didn't he? Uh, I know he was injured, but yeah. whether he was just trying to hold on GC. Uh, I was attacking sure. on the uh, most useless hills to try and get away from the peloton. And then Moscon tries to follow yeah, him and descends. And then they, <laughs> that leads to a crash from Moscon. So, yeah, I think Nibali was just trying to race there. And uh, I don't think we had high hopes going into that Giro for Nibali. And I think that the only reason he was there is probably because he wanted to be there and also because of marketing purposes yeah, that they wanted 100%. to get the value out of his... Uh, high contract that he has at Trek Sega Fredor had because it's kind of still running, you know, until end December. But True, yeah. Uh, yeah, overall, I think it's not the season we were expecting. Like, at least my take on it. And as well, Benji, two top 10s in World Tour stage races, including Grand Tours. Fifth for Skelmose Jensen at UAE, where he got on the right side of the crosswind split. So fortuitous, but right place, right time again, but then he had to hold on the climbs fifth there and then seventh for Sturvin at Benelux. So broadly not competitive on GC in World Tour one weeks either, Trek Segafredo, and not competitive in World Tour sprints really outside of Pedersen, who has a heavy load as both their classics leader typically, and one would think they'll go share with Sturvin, and then, and then their sprinter as well out of Paris-Nice. So a lot hinges on Mads Pedersen uh, at Trek Segafredo. Other bright spot spots, though, were Tour de Wallony Quinn Simmons winning a stage in GC, uh, still a teenager, I think, in a two-dot pro race with tough competition there. And I'm trying to look for some other bright spots. I mean, Nibali winning Cecil- uh, Giro de Sicilia, Benji, good marketing, I guess. And, yeah, that's about that's about it, I think. Uh, Pedersen coming back, that Denmark sprint was good. But what do you what do you see from this as the glaring like what's missing in this team to be to be better? And what do we even mean by better? Do, do you, is it being in the top three of world tour stages more regularly? Is it being in the top five or seven of GC in world tour stage races generally? Like what is better? Because both of those things are missing for me. 
I think it's a combination of many things. First of all, last year we already mentioned that we don't see a clear future when it comes to a GC rider with time trial, with climbing abilities on this team. Shalmose Jensen is one of the riders that has that quality, but has not proven himself in world to races enough to even be considered in the uh, top 10 in a Dauphiné, for example. So he's not at that level yet. So we're not near that yet. But if you look further, a Chicone just doesn't have that time trial. And then we already start looking at the very youngsters. We saw JP Lopez for the uh, first time GC-wise in the Vuelta. He actually did pretty well for the initial part of that Vuelta and ended up 13th in the end, which is good. But once again, it's not the guy with the best time trial skills. So they are missing something there as a GC leader, in my opinion. Molemos kind of passed it in that area, in my eyes, but... If he can prove me wrong, I'm fine. No, he with could it. do it. He could definitely do it. He doesn't want to. Mollema can okay. top ten GC one week World Tour races. Yeah. He can. Yeah, but why would he? I know. Um, sprinter. They don't have an all-out pure sprinter, as in Mespedes. And sure, he can sprint, but this year that was not really the case in the majority of the races. He obviously had that COVID issue, and that has led into many, uh, many of his races, but. It only ended up being very valuable in the likes of a Norway and Denmark Rundfahrt. And I think also one stage win in the early season. The Kuhn, of course, is the one I'm looking for. But outside of that, Bing Bang is second place. He didn't have those, those wins. And the ones at World Tour that I'm looking for for Peterson in sprints. And last year he had that at Polonia, of course. But Polonia is a, a lower classification of sprints, of course. I was expecting more from his sprints this year, and I think that they lack a reliable sprinter that can cons- consistently give them sprint victories. And then we look at Moschetti, who is looking at their team, one of their outsider sprinters, but he's also very inconsistent and unreliable throughout the season. So I don't know. They're missing that to get easy victories, uh, also in one dot pro and so forth. So yeah, they're missing that. And then when I look at stadiums in the breakaway they've been up there like fawn two they were second and third with elison and with molema once again but the problem is there's always someone in there that is better balfinado was better in fawn two mater was better in the stage that molema was yeah, in as true. well in the giro stage then again here well mohoric kind of ruined the molema there by having him chase for like 10 kilometers <laughs> by mohoric was in the first break together with mater and molema was chasing alone and he was trying to follow, and it took like 30 kilometers before Molema could uh, actually get to the front group. So that probably had an influence on his energy at the end of the stage. But yeah, all that stuff, they're just always one short. I think Steven was also second on that stage in the tour that Mohoric won, stage or was seven, it the Giro yeah. stage? Stage seven, Tour de France. So uh, yeah, there's always like one rider better. And yeah, that's, that's an aspect that uh, is important. And they don't necessarily have the riders that could be that one rider better in many occasions, unless for Mullimuff, in my eyes. I think Sturvin was very, very good this year. goes without saying he won their biggest race of the year. Yeah. I think, obviously, he should have medaled at Worlds uh, as well. And, you know, pretty consistent classics and fourth at Tour of Flanders is not too bad at all. And then, like, Criterium de Dauphiné, he was kind of going for sprints. He, he really climbs quite well, yes, for Sturvin. And had a, yeah, I don't know. He'd be almost a clearer leader in the classics on other teams. I'm not sure if Pedersen, I don't know, like Paris Roubaix, for example, Pedersen got crashed out by Rowe. If if Pedersen comes third in Roubaix, do it, does that change our perspective on yeah, things? You know, maybe, it probably does. Maybe it does. <laughs> I think what Benji is talking about with Moschetti, I think with team construction. Just a guy like Moschetti is just not moving the needle. You look at – unless you're Ineos and uh, UAE, where even UAE, frankly, like Juan Sebastian Milano, he's better than Moschetti as a sprinter in like those dot yeah. pro attacks. He's better than Moschetti. And unless you're Ineos or UAE, if you're like the De Koenigs or other teams racking up points, you need multiple good sprinters. And Trek are kind of missing that. And I think – there's just so many points and stages available in all these races and all these stage races. Sometimes if there's a five-day stage race, two or three will be sprints. 
and you need a guy coming second or third or fourth first to pick up points. Now, we don't really talk about UCI points, and I'll say this in this pod so I don't have to say it in for the rest of the team previews. The UCI point system is completely fucked. A, if you win a World Tour stage, so uh, Paris, say you win Paris, the weekend stage, say you win, win Criterium de Dauphiné, on, uh, you beat Lopez and Port on uh, La Plan, Marc Padoud, you get 60 UCI points. If you come, let me check just to make sure my facts are correct. If you come third in Copa Bernocchi dot pro race on a Monday in October, two minutes behind Avonapol, you get the same number of, no, sorry, you get double the UCI points. You get 125 UCI points. If you come sixth, you get more points. So Antonio Pupio, who came sixth in Copa Bernocchi, probably not televised, it was, got more UCI points than uh, a World Tour stage win. So the system is pretty broken. You get a lot of points for like fifth, 225, I think, on GC and World Tour stage races. So Kelderman has over 1,000 points. This year, it's, to me, not equivalent to actual success, and I hope teams don't use it as a KPI because if sponsors are sponsoring teams for exposure, the UCI points to me seem completely disconnected from actual exposure have you got any thoughts on that system benji because me and you we, neither of us really look at it normally yeah certainly because it obviously isn't good enough and that goes back to i think the year where matthews did very well in the canadian classics quebec and montreal where winning one of those quebec or montreal had the same amount of points as winning milano san remo and winning milano san remo is about 50 times more important than quebec is that a good amount if Matthews wins, then no, they're equal. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Let's go to the next thread because this is becoming an Australia advertisement propaganda. <laughs> Onto the transfers now, which is my favorite part of this. So the outgoing from Trek Segafredo, Kern de Court had that unfortunate accident here in Andorra. He rolled uh, one of those buggy quad bike things and hurt his hand really badly. He's retired. Kiel Rainian, the American's retired. Vincenzo is going to Astana, and so his big salary is coming off the books, although that doesn't necessarily mean the money's still there. Maybe Segafredo were only putting it up because he was there. Ryan Mullen to Bora Hansgrower to be the uh, lead-up man for Sam Bennett. Nicholas Egg back to Uno X, the Danish guy. Didn't really work out. Nicola Conchi to Gazprom. Antonio Nibali to Astana with his brother. Michael Rees to Arkea and Charlie Quarterman. I'm not sure what's happening with him. So there are no – the only wins going out, Benji, is Nibali to – Nibali. Um, Nibali to Nibali. What? Yeah. No, so the, like he's the only rider of those riders leaving that won a race this year. So I don't think they're, oh, okay. I don't think they're yeah. missing too much. Um, I wouldn't have re-signed any of those riders either, frankly. I agree. I believe that Nibali's salary was uh, way too high for what he was worth, and that's – a very big Nibali fan saying that. We said that a year ago that he wouldn't be worth re-signing and he's proven it when it comes to his results. Sure, he broke his wrist or had a wrist injury in the Giro, but I don't think it would have changed too much. Perhaps he would have uh, accidentally ended up in the top 10, but I don't think it would have been much more than that because he's obviously focusing on GC, which I, at this point in his career, don't like because I would love for him to go to a Grand Tour. Please let this be the year at Astana. Go to a Grand Tour for stage wins and just win a stage, man. Come on, do it for me. But um, yeah, there's not that much gone. And you look at these riders and I think they're replaceable. And we look at the riders that are coming in and I see, I don't know, it is a mixed bag. <laughs> it is. You see it the same way? I, it, it's real love-hate for me. Like I, I have really strong opinions on all of them both positively and negative. I'll do the positives first because we were, I was a little bit negative about their, their season review. I think Trek have done some really good business here in for some of these riders. First of all, Dan Hull, on coming from Sec Racing Academy, big Dutch rider, 22 years old. He won Italian one-day race, second at Flanders Tomorrow Tour behind Mick van Dijk, big engine, sixth U23 ITT. I think he's like two metres tall, you know, 85 kegs. This guy, uh, part of the Dutch dominant team time trial at Tour de l'Avenir. Um, he, he's just going to slot perfectly, and one would think, into their already strong classics team of Pedersen Turns, 
Sturvin. Um, yeah, he's just slot in there. And also, one thing I've noticed, particularly Paris East, the one that Case Bowl won, where Pedersen was good and and was did come third and second in stages one and two there. The problem with Pedersen's leadouts has been being left on the front too early uh, because they've just run out of men. They they've had Sturvin, they've had Edward Turns, they need the Casper Asgren engine or to do the 1600 meters or 1500 meters to 800 meters. And that's where I think Darnul should fit in. Are you as high on him, Benji? Uh, is he like a Niels Eckhoff kind of guy to me? For me, his best results or his most important results are that I think AFAT was at Shime Banj or something at the end of the season. And then early season at top at 20 at Le Samad. Those are races I would love to see him be done in more and you're right that's more the classics theme but then i look at their report of when they signed him and the words of mark Lidiz are their talents code are that he's going to be part of the lead out for moschetti or peterson i think that's more going to be the lead out for peterson personally i think you'd probably agree on that he's this guy's better than moschetti <laughs> the fuck is he going to be leading out for drop him <laughs> and uh, also going to be a time trialist and that's something i don't like about the way they announce these transfers because Don Hola, for example, we'll speak about some of the others later, like a Baroncini and uh, yeah, like a Baroncini, for example, they all are announced as they're potentially good time trialists in the future, but literally 90% of the world tour new young signings have gotten good time trial results in their U23 years. Like I can say that about 90% of these riders I'm more impressed by the other results and I'm more impressed by the other roles they can give to a team because time trialing is great, but at younger years, you want them to be able to support a team as well. And you want them to be able to have potential in other areas as well so that they're not solely time trialists because we've seen that that is somewhat of a dying breathe in the peloton unless you're one of the very best time trialists. And that's what I like about Don Hall as well is that he's versatile in many areas. And the same goes for some of the other youngsters they signed. One of the more unknown ones is Marek Brustinga, Spanish rider. Uh, he is 22 wrote for filial Cajarural, which is basically a U23 team for the Pro Conti team of Cajarural. So, uh, yeah, he wrote mainly the Copa España there, which is this year-long tournament of multiple Spanish races for the youngsters in Spain or amateur riders in Spain. Don't know if it's combined or solely youngsters. And he ended up third in that Copa España after winning five Spanish uh, races right there. And according to Irizar, once again, the talent score at Trek, versatile sprinter, lead out for Moschetti and Peterson. So same story. They're looking to build mm-hmm. that up a bit more. And also a good rider for the future for Northern Classics. And it seems like that's a focus for both these signings. And I don't know. Where's he got that yeah. from? Where's he got the, fa- the, the fact that a 22-year-old Spanish kid, who, I don't, as he raced north of the Pyrenean <laughs> border, is going to be good in the Northern Classics? Like... <laughs> Yeah, Spanish riders good in the Northern Classics are, are very few and far between. You know, Juan Antonio <laughs> Fletcher, one of the better ones. He, this guy, he said he's good Healy. I mean, Euros, European champs, and Avid Lavanier and Worlds, he DNF'd. So, yeah, I don't, I'm sure it's fine. I'm sure he's not being paid a million bucks, but I don't really see it with <laughs> him. But. Yeah, so I'm a bit bit lower on on Brustenga. That's, mm-hmm. a, that's a funny signing from my perspective. Uh, but Baroncini, Benji, the other talent, mm-hmm. and these are all the they're, they're all stacking up. They've already got Quinn Simmons is super young. They got Skill Mosey Jensen. Baroncini, we mentioned him in a recent podcast. Obviously, one Europe, uh, one World Champs U23, second at European Champs U, uh, Road Race, stage at Juppé Bigiro. Looks like a great one-day racer. I can't wait to see him at Lombardia and all the Italian one-days. I think just quickly, we yeah, we just see him as a good one-day racer. Can't, hopefully, he goes to La Guelia straight away in, in February or March, and I think he'll be pretty good straight away, actually. I agree. Italian Classics is where I see him as well. And same story, he's announced to be a time trialist and decent climber for the team. But I would straight up say Italian Classics is the area that he's showing well at. And that Coppa Sabatini result is still the one that I'm most hyped about because that was against World Tour competition. And yes, he got beaten by Vlogan and Cole Rally, but he beat the likes of Moscon and Kovi. So yeah, that shows that you can beat pretty decent riders on a hilly parkour in Italy. And we've got quite a few of those. 
in the uh, .pro and .1 races. So now going to the tra- incoming transfers for riders who you will be familiar with, and some of these uh, make no sense. So Tony Gallopin from Azure Desert Citroën. Okay, uh, you've already got Julian Bernard. I don't know what Tony Gallopin. Not going to move the needle. Dario Cataldo on a one-year deal. Maybe they want him to. It's a transition into becoming staff member. He's I think thirty-six, coming from Novastar. Your yeah, friend of Ch- Trek, love of friends and family deal, don't they? Antonio Nibali. <laughs> Um, Egghorn, there's friends for Pedersen. Well, now Jasper Sturven, if you win a monument, you get, when you get to sign one of your friends. So, well, well, actually, Otto Verhard is a friend of Steven. And no, he's that's signing. what I mean. <laughs> he, won, he won MSR, and with MSR in the in his contract, you get to sign one of your mates at, at Trek Sigafredo. That seems to be how the contracts work because <laughs> Nibali, oh no, Nibali won it at Bahrain. Um, yeah, Otto Verhard, the guy who you remember headbutting the Kazakh, a stunner rider and getting DNA, getting disqualified from. Tour of Flanders has got a deal there from um, from Alperson. So, yeah, he'll just slot in as a domestique, one would think, in their classics team. Uh, but otherwise, other signings include Antoine Tolhook from Jumbo Visma. He won a stage of Tour de Suisse in 2019, second at Andalusia uh, this year, 27, turning 28 in April. He's not a young prospect anymore on a two-year deal. And I don't know what he's getting paid. Listen, if it's on a tiny salary, then why not? If it's on a lot, then I don't really see it either. Simon Pello, who came from Androni, I don't mind. I just I think Pello actually could be good in a break, Benji, on a world tour team who's like, okay, you don't need to go for the Fugadi Fuga. What, what's the award? The Giro Award? Called? <laughs> yeah, I think it's that Fuga de la Fuga or something. <laughs> no, that's but, the most uh... thing. He goes in the suicide breaks. Yeah, don't do that anymore. Let's try to win some stages, Simon. Yeah, certainly. But one of the transfers that I am pretty uh, interested in, that I'm not sure will be great, but does show potential, is another Danish youngster that's joining Osbjö and Helle which is basically uh, the same we had with Schalmose Jensen last year. We didn't know what Schalmose Jensen was at the start of the season, and he ended up being a climber with decent time trial skills. Well, that's exactly what this guy is because he's also decent at the ITT and decent at climbing. He was top five at the Giro U23. His only problem there was that he punctured in the time trial, so he couldn't show his time trial skills in that race. But he's just very similar to the Dane they already have for that. And I'm curious what that will offer. And I'm also curious whether it's staff related or something that they also sign a lot of Danish youngsters or whether yeah, their scout has a lot <laughs> in the area. Because uh, it's notable that their signings are all like Italian, Danish, I know. Belgian, and Netherlands. It's like they want to build on the countries they already have. It's like people in a pro cycling manager safe. They're like, oh, I've got Spanish and Italian riders. Let's only get Spanish and Italian riders from this point onwards. Yeah, Rival, Colpac, and Leopard seem to feed them a little bit, or oh, quite a bit. And the last signing is, uh, last two signings is Hulgard from UNOX. And I think he, this guy's. I can't wait to see what he'll do at a World Tour team. And But the interesting thing, Benji, for me is, does he race with Sturvin Pedersen Turns group? Uh, do, is that because he's the guy who's fast or do they send him to some maybe a bit hillier races? Because he came 8th at E3, 19th at Amstel. Uh, let, me, let me cherry pick some other results. He won, obviously, that Arctic race uh stage and i said someone signed him seventh at europeans on a hilly circuit a very impressive 12th at worlds do you split him up benji and you send him to like the dauphiné you remember those dauphiné stages called brelli was was uh the best sprinter at i feel like you send him there and split i would split him apart from the pedersen sturvin turns group except for maybe the the three e3 and babelham tour of flanders We'll talk about it in a bit when it comes to the uh, races that we would send certain riders to, but I would be looking at Hulgar to go to the couple races because if you get a top 10 ID3, you need to be at those races. Sure. And next to that, Amstel, I think that LBL might be too much for him, but I don't know because, well, I don't know. <laughs> I <think it's> too- <laughs> as simple as that. What's you gotta, I think it's too much. you got to be top, top yeah. puncher. Yeah, I feel like Amstel is still on the border of you can do this if you're... Uh, that kind of rider, a Bravo and Sapel as well, but perhaps that's not worthy enough of also filling up the calendar if you're already doing the cobbles and also one hill race of doing Brabant as well as perhaps a very heavy schedule for a guy that just joined World Tour. But 
After that, there's really the question of where you send him in a Grand Tour. We spoke about him in one of our Grand Tour previews. I think it was our Giro preview, but in hindsight, I'm not sure. We'll talk about it in a bit, but which one would fit him better? Because would you send him to a Giro where Ciccone is likely leader with four domestiques and you've got Moschetti for the sprints and and Hulgard is like, should I be supportive or should I go in breakaways? I think he's a Vuelta man. I think you let him ease into the season a little bit and then go Vuelta whilst Servan and Co. do Benelux, etc. You're missing Bing back then, though. Yeah, yeah, but send Pedersen. Pedersen and Co. will do Bingo Bongo. So. But this year, Bingo Bongo was not very good for Stefan and Pedersen. <laughs> oh, that, I, I'm expecting uh, to tease what, I'm about, what I'll say in the future. I'm expecting them to be a, oh, little, okay. bit, a little bit better next year. Aberastri is the last signing from Caja Rural. Makes no sense to me. I was talking about, you know, you need more sprinters, but Moschetti and Aberastri are not the solution. Nothing against the guy. He's 32. He is a journeyman pro Conti sprinter and didn't, like, what, he won this year? Did he, he won a Slovenia? He's just not that fast. Like, let's be real. Um, what I found the weirdest when it comes to the announcement of his transfer, they were talking about that they were missing, the general manager said this, that they were missing a rider with these characteristics. And I'm like, Moschetti's right there, mate. <laughs> Moschetti's God. also a pro Conti sprinter. Yeah. Like, it's the same level. And I don't know, Moschetti has shown, like, stages where he was, like, actually, like, world tour worthy, like, once in three years or something. But that's not reliable enough to have that as your main sprinter. And it was only in the likes of a Trofeo Mallorca or something, Palma or what, what it was, in those Mallorcan challenges at the start of the year. So it's not like he's shown that in a world tour race yet. And I've got the same feeling about Abarastu. He's going to get perhaps top six, sevens, top fives at Vuelta sprints. But then again, if you've got riders like Moschetti, would you, who, who do you think is better, Moschetti or Abarastu? Um, <laughs> I don't know, nor do I care. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think... Well, the difference between certain, certain world tour teams is you, in my view, the point of having a world tour team, hot take, is to win world tour races. And for yeah. the non-world tour races, unless they have a very specific marketing benefit or they have a historical like Kerner, the idea of them is to maybe use them as development for other riders. So you see Jumbo Visma, they send to, to Tour de Hungary or Crow Race, Mick van Dijk and Olaf Koy, or even Tour de Polonia, Decker, to get experience in the races that are not as important. They don't sign a 32-year-old to actually try and win those races. And I would rather Trek had signed, even if it may not be possible, but an example, Luca Colnaghi, 22-year-old, quick man, Italian on, or he might be committed somewhere else, uh, but he was on a Conti team. I think he is. But that maybe, I'm sure if Trek had come knocking a year ago, the probably would, would have gone to Trek. I would rather they send him to those races. He probably gets almost less consistent, but similar-ish results to Aberastri. And at least he then has the upside and then he can maybe be winning World Tour races for you in the future. But that's their transfers. A mixed bag. I largely think they're great. Think, no, sorry. I largely think they're good because I don't think these riders, the, the ones that I'm a bit iffy on, I don't think they're getting paid an enormous amount. I could be wrong, but yeah, I think I think it's largely pretty good and their young core is looking pretty good. But in the last thoughts on their transfers, Benji, how would you rate it out of 10? About a, a five in the middle. Depending on salaries, I'd give it a six and a half, seven, because I think Hulga, I think there's some real, okay. ups, real, real upside in there. Uh, but now moving on to our projections for their squads for each discipline next year, which you might have already touched on a little bit, but Giro d'Italia Benji will be Ciccone GC. Too early for Baroncini? I'd say too early for Baroncini. Um, sure, he's not the youngest guy that they signed in the team. is 21, but usually you don't end up sending your rider to the first round where they go to. I've got my list as Ciccone for GC leader, Cataldo, Brambia, Mosca yep. as mountain yep. domestiques. Mosca being a very underrated domestique even by us because we don't talk about him on the uh, domestique podcast, but I look back at his Giro and he was there like top 50s every single stage in the mountain stage. He's one of the last 
like the 10 to 15 riders in the group every time. He, he's very underrated in that aspect. And I think that he's necessary in a team like this at the Giro if you once again go for Ciccone and GC. And time trial-wise, it's the Grand Tour. You need to go for Ciccone and GC. We've spoken about it already. You were the one that brought it up as a Ciccone uh, fitting the climbs and race of the Giro this year, right? Yeah, Chicano is, is if he doesn't this is the year for him to do GC. Like it's perfect for him. And particularly if there is no pog rog, I think it's pretty defendable for him to to go for GC, particularly when it's not realistic at the tour or the well, maybe Welter, but Tour de France top five I just don't see being feasible. So yep. it, this is Italian on a half Italian team, parkour suits him, no TTKs some sort of descent finishes, got to go for it. Uh, just hopefully he stay, stays upright. Tiberi, I think, a little bit early for him to go. They, they'll they send Moschetti Benji t- with maybe one man yeah. as a lead out, right? That's what they do. I don't right? know who, though. I've been looking at their team and I'm like, should you send Abrasturi as lead out? I, I don't know. Mark <laughs> 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 I don't know. I generally don't know who they would send as lead out. And then they're looking, I'm looking at the riders that they signed already and 22-year-old Don Hola, is that too early to go to the Giro? I don't know. It's usually not the first year when they go into Walter that they are sent to these races, but he's already 22, so it's very much possible that it happens. So someone will have to go. We just don't know who yet. But Simmons, Mayorosa attempt, or do you not send him to the Giro? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know what program they're going to do with Simmons again next year. Um, I don't know where he fits. He's like He's the most talented rider on their team. In my view, but he, I don't know where he fits in. Uh, I hadn't really thought, but yeah, Giro, I see Moschetti for sprints and Chicone, GC, maybe a yeah. toll hook or toll hook goes there as a, as a domestique yeah. as well. Uh, Tour de France, I think, will be the Danes. <laughs> like when you've got Pedersen, I think it'll be Pedersen, Skelmos against us, Sturvin going for sprints. And I think that'll actually be pr- pretty good. And I think Balcom Olema going for breakaway stages in the mountains later on. So I think that's. Quite a good. I think it, most teams would be envious of that position. And Welter, who knows? Well, impossible to do the Welter. In terms of classics, Benji, I've got Sturvin, Pedersen, Hulgard, because you convinced me, uh, Edward Turns, Otto Vergeda, and anyone else? Uh, I also had the list Ivan Pedersen, Turns, Simmons, Hulgard, Vergeda. That's the six riders I had named the likes of an Eggholm went to some cobble races last year but he didn't have every single one of them so was Kirsch. it useful i'm not sure Kirsch definitely yeah. on the list for these then you've got seven riders probably can find another one that can fill that up without Don being Hola. too uh down holler yeah definitely a go. good a good call that one so uh that's that but when it comes to the hilly classics and i'm kind of looking at we've got the Ardennes Classics, which is Amstel, LBL, and Flesh, even though is Amstel even in the Ardennes? Not really, but anyway, we'll take it. And then you've got the Italian hill stages towards the end of the season. And um, then I'm like, I'm divided because I would send Boroncini to the Italian Classics, but I'm not sure I would send him to the hilly Classics yet. Um, I would I would let him do the Masnata schedule that he did at Masnata at the end of this year. Uh, I think he could do pretty well there, and he, he gets another year almost of development. It's eleven months away. Yeah, certainly with with Tiberi as well. Uh, sorry, I would say going back to the Tour de France, uh, I think they'll send Skelmosi Jensen to go for GC. Yeah, because Should. he's Danish and he could get tenth to twelfth if he keeps improving. JP Lopez, I think, will go well to GC again. That is a note on the Vuelta. And now on the Hilly Classics, in terms of the Ardennes, I think it'll be Hulgard for some, and then Mollema as well uh, will be their leader. I think Mollema is still eighth at Amstel, eighth at Liège, I think. So he won Lombardy not too long ago. I think they got a pretty good Hilly one-day team, but they just got hit with injuries and Mollema over race this year. I think Brambilla, Ciccone, Mollema is is pretty good, uh, generally Yeah, speaking. but... I'm missing a rider that can win those races, and the only rider that I see winning a, a Hill Classic is someone that goes beyond what we are currently seeing from him, and that's Simmons. But which races would you send him to? We're saying, oh, we'll send him to the Cobble Race, and then to the Hill Classics, to Strade, to the Italian Classics, to the Tour. We can't send the guy to everything. So <laughs> do you think that he can do both Cobbles and Hills, or do you think that he's better at Hills than Cobbles, or better at Cobbles than Hills? 
he was good at Strato before he crashed or punctured. Yeah, very good. Good in the Vuelta and some of those breaks. I don't know. He, he just he, he'll be turning twenty one next year. I don't know. To be honest, I don't know what he might decide again, Benji, to gain ten kilos or lose ten kilos in the off season. He might be doing mountain bike stuff. I don't know. He, he you look at that four Nardesh result at the start of the year where he's he, he's sort of in between the likes of Tullet, Car, Rui Costa, Bagi, Thibaut Pino, Vlasov, Carthy. The kid can climb. So I would lean him more towards that sort of stuff because it's to your point, Benji. All those guys I mentioned, none of them can sprint for shit. And uh, yeah. to win a race, you either need to go solo. And Mollema knows that, so he goes solo. But you can't always go solo. And Simmons is very, very fast. And I think in a reduced group, yeah, he can. he's the one. If, you, if you've got a group of 10 or 12, right, and you've got Chicone Mollema and they wait for Simmons and then lead him out, mm-hmm. I, think he, I think he's dangerous in those sort of races. You- think that he's an outsider for the likes of an MSR, for example, because I see him getting over to Poggio and he's got an, a he got a sprint for it. But what's his positioning like? Stuff like that. We don't really know that. But are we mm-hmm. shouting him too highly if we say that he can be an outsider, like heavy outsider? Like, I like I not a... Okay. I don't see it. He's, his positioning and decision-making is not good enough. Um, okay. And Sterling... Sterling's the man there, so I don't think there'll be the opportunity for it, frankly. But yeah, GC at Tour de Wallonie is impressive, and then sixth at Britannia Classic last year when he was nineteen years old. So I'm I'm really really keen to see how this group of twenty two year olds and below develop at Trek Segafredo. I think they they do have a good host of young guys in Baroncini, in let me look down, Asbjorn Helmosa, Dan Hul. JP Lopez, a little bit older. Um, Skelmose Jensen, Simmons, Tiberi. That's a lot of teams would be happy with that. And just Cataldo. They go, yeah, and then, then there's the other spectrum, <laughs> Cataldo. <and other laughs> um, but yeah, I'm keen to see how those guys develop. I hope they get opportunities. I hope they get sent to the right races as well. But yeah, uh, onto their over under wins, Benji. Two World Tour wins this year. I'm setting the over under at at five because two is really bad but five world tour wins over or under for trek i think i'm gonna say five is that over or under that's you that's not a, i'm saying that four i'm saying the line at four and a half benji over or under <laughs> four and a half <laughs> over then five okay. i'm going <laughs> we over. did this last year as well i think yeah i know benji just <laughs> never, obviously never bet on American sports. Um, I'm going over as well. I think it'd be. I'd be very surprised if they were under that. I think Pedersen and Sturvin will come. Sturvin was good. I think Pedersen will be better next year. Hopefully, I, I just I'm hoping and optimistic for his his condition after recovering from COVID. Um, I mean, what about do they top five a Grand Tour, Benji? Uh, the only chance that they really have is the uh, Chiro in my eyes, which is Chicone and. It's going to be, I think he's going to finish seventh or so in the Giro. I just don't see it for getting that top five. I think that he's got the capabilities to keep it up for two weeks in a ground tour. Sure, the parkour does fit him on paper. He could on paper do a top five, but I'm going to say seventh anyway. I think he will come about fifth in the Giro. So I'm saying yes, please stay on your bike, Julio. Um, So I'm going yes. Do you think they podium a World Tour stage race, GC? Any World Tour stage race? Yeah. I think yes. Yeah. And I think they're going to do it with... <laughs> They'll backdoor hmm, it. Bingo, they do it. Bingo Bongo with Sturvin. It'll be a backdoor one like that. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that or something where Shelmos Jensen accidentally... Is it Skelmos Jensen or Shelmos Jensen? If someone knows that, I drop it in the comment section. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Skelmos Jensen, whoever it is, I think he accidentally will end up at a high position in one of the stages and will have to defend it in the last mountain stage after the time trial going very well and will end up third at some race. All right. Time for our most anticipated section, the hot takes. Benji, 
what do you have any hot takes lined up? I can't remember. I think we said Sturman should be leader for MSR. Um, I think <laughs> my hot take is Mads Pedersen in yellow <laughs> at the tour. I think <laughs> I, I think it can happen. But how? Can he not do it after stage First five? First prologue? So prologue is good TT. So he could yeah. even take possible there. Then he's got all these sort of bonus seconds in the sprint stages. He's going to get so many bonus seconds in the sprint then, stages, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then stage five, he, he wins solo. So I, I reckon Pedersen in yellow, maybe for a week. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's my hot take. Pedersen in yellow. Okay. I think uh, I'm going to go for Skelmos will top 10 the tour. <laughs> Mate, he can't climb. He's not good. <laughs> Skelmos Jensen. I don't think he's good. You just said he would get 13 from the tour. Yeah, but top 10 is different to 13. <laughs> Three positions. <laughs> yeah, no, nah, no, nah, significant. Mate, he's he's gonna Guillaume Martin, okay? He's yeah, gonna go in the breakaway true, true. the third week. Max, they won't know who he is. Gain eight minutes, then yeah. he will open his jacket and fall from seventh to tenth, and just finish on tenth. Facts, that that is true. Like he'll get in a break, and no one will know who this guy is, and then he'll, <laughs> yeah, so possible. Uh, my, I want Hulgard. Like the hot take is Hulgard winning a monument, <laughs> winning MSR. <laughs> like I think Hulgard's so good, dude. Uh, I think I th- I think Hulgard will win three pro races this year for them in twenty twenty two. I think I think Hulgard is is pretty good. Is uh, that a hot take though? Three races is like not – there's not that many riders winning three races. It's not 1-1. One, one. It's got to be dot pro or above. It's got to be like a professional race, even though I know – Is it. Norway dot pro? Uh, Norway is dot pro, yeah. Uh, so oh. <laughs> cheating there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of other hot takes I have. Um My, my hot take is that Otto Vergara will once again get disqualified <laughs> in RVV. I think – I think Pelo, I don't know, he should be able to win a Giro stage from the break if he actually goes in the right break. Like, he just always goes in the suicide breaks. Uh, I think Aberastri doesn't win a race. I'm not sure that's a hot take or just um, just facts. You got any cold takes, Benji? Very cold takes. Oh, hmm. Looking at cold takes, I'm like, Mullamo wins a stage in the, in the Grand Tour this year. <laughs> oh. <laughs> If he ends up not winning, that will look so bad. Cold take, Tony Galpin still washed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens. We see cool guys wash and then like DeMarkey takes, Malia Rosa or Galapan takes, <laughs> takes like the well to lead his jersey for three days. This is what happens. So it's actually good if you get cooled washed. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I don't know. I, I think I've already said mine and I'm hoping Chicone does well this year. I even think Ch- Chicone can win – a stage or two from the from the GC group in this year, right? depending on who's there. Um, I'm I'm really high on him. Uh, but yeah, that's. Do you think as uh, a last question, Benji? I'm scared. At what point do they change it around and Sturvin gets more respect put on his name in the classics, and it's not about Pedersen? If if Pedersen doesn't come back to maybe 2020, Pedersen. When at what point do they do it, and do they do you think they will make that decision? Well, I think that Pedersen's only well moment of being selected as leader was Roubaix this year, because I was expecting Steven to be the leader in all the others. Really? Yeah. RVV, you reckon Steven was leader? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think that Steven's better on do double hills? That? Yeah, but I'm saying, do they know that? Well, I don't know. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not Mikel Iris, our talent scout, and <laughs> Gersilan Elena or something, general manager. I don't choose this, but I think that Steven's better for RVV than uh, than Peterson is personally. Then again, Peterson already podiumed RVV in the past. Yeah, has Steven ever podiumed RVV? I don't know, but yeah, Peterson I don't know either. <laughs> anyway, for the Trek for Segafredo Women's Podcast preview, that will be a separate podcast. We'll obviously be doing Women's World Tour 
previews as well. So I hope you stay tuned for whenever whenever that drops. And I hope you enjoyed this. Let us know your hot and cold takes for Trek Segafredo. Do you like their signings? Do you not like their signings? Um, do you agree with us that it's a bit of a mixed bag? It seems a bit tailored two halves to or two different strands to me, but uh, I really like some of the young guys. They are signing. I can't wait to see them. And yeah, I hope Pedersen has a better year next year. But that's all from us at the Trek Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for the call for supporting the podcast, uh, for supporting the show. We'll see you so shortly. Ciao.